Hello. Uh, I thought I'd do something a bit different in this video. Um, rather than making something more involved uh, over a number of videos, I thought I'd make uh, a simple game from start to finish in a single video. Um, hopefully that will be under an hour, but um, we'll have to wait and see, I guess. Um, and, and the game I'm going to make is a, a, a Tron clone. Um, so... Uh, just to show you what it is that we'll be making. Um, it's there we go. So it's it's basically um, like multiplayer snake. Um, so players are going to move around the game board, um, leaving a trail behind them, and a player will die if they either leave the game screen, so leave the edges of the screen, or if they hit any place on the board that isn't empty. So that's, you know, if they collide with other players or if they loop round and hit themselves. Um, so that's what it is that we're going to be making. Um, I'm going to create... Um, so I'm starting from just a blank, um, a blank Pico 8 um, file. So I'll make a new, a new one. Um, let's just save as uh, tron.p8. So we've got that file. Um, and I think I'm going to split the game into three different tabs. So um, every game obviously has the initialization. Um, in this tab, I'll have the update function. And then in the third one, I'll have the draw function. So We've got um, underscore in it. So this is run once at the start of the game, once the Pico 8 file is run. We've got um, an update function, which is run once per frame. And then we've got the draw function, which is also run once per frame, but after the update function finishes. So we um, have our three tabs, and I've added, um, if you add a comment on the top line of a tab, then when you hover, it tells you what's um, in each tab. So it just helps to separate out the code. And I think what I'm going to do first is to draw the game board. And the way that's going to work is um, we're going to store the pixel, uh, sorry, we're going to store the color of every pixel on the game board. So in Pico 8, it's um, 128 pixels by 128 pixels. So we're going to store the color of every pixel in a, a two-dimensional table in rows and columns. And I think each pixel will be set as an initial color, so whatever the background color is that we choose. And then whenever a player moves into a new space on the board, so a new pixel that's not been set to anything other than the background colour, we'll set it to the colour of that player. So hopefully that'll become clearer uh, once we start writing some code, but that's what we're going to do first of all. Um, so I'm going to create a board, and to begin with, um, I'm just going to make it um, empty, so it's an empty table. And what we need, need to do is to build up um, columns and rows. So we need to create um, 128 columns and then each one of those columns will have 128 items in them. So we're going to say um, for, uh, let's start with columns. So column um, 0 to 127, so that's 128 columns. Um, so for each column we want to say the board for that column is an empty table. So we've now got 128 empty columns. And then we can say for each row, in that column, we want to say board at that column and at that row is equal to um, something like um, 2. 
that's just the background color that we can choose and we can choose any color we want actually um, so all the colors are here so two would actually be this uh, sort of maroon which is fine um, but what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to say uh, BG color is equal to two and then set it to the BG color So, sort of started off with the most difficult part of the code, really, which is to create this two-dimensional, um, this two-dimensional table. So, just to go over it one more time, we're creating 128 different columns, and for each of the columns that we create, we're adding 128 rows, and then saying the pixel at that column and that row is equal to two, which is the background color. So, if I just run that then nothing happens, but there's no errors in there. Um, so then the next thing I'm going to do is to draw the board in here. So this is um, create the game board. And then here we want to say draw the game board. And the code to draw is going to be fairly similar. Um, we need to say um, for each column from 0 to 127. So that will get us, get us each of the 128 columns in turn. And then for each row, we can then use um, the p set function which sets the pixel uh, sets a, a single pixel on the screen and we want to set the pixel um, at column c well that's the x coordinate really and then the y coordinate is the row so it's columns and rows and we want to set that to whatever the pixel um, on the board at that column and row. And at the beginning of the draw function, we're going to clear the screen each frame. So what that does is it loops through each column and each row, and then it sets the pixel at that column and row, so that coordinate, to whatever the value is in this board table at that position. So if I run, because the um, background color is two, which is that maroon, it's drawn, um, it's gone through the entire screen and drawn a maroon pixel at each position on the game board. And we can test that quickly by saying, if we were to set um, board, let's just pick uh, 10, 10, and we were to set that to something like seven, then if I run, you can see that it's actually, uh, color seven is white, and it's set um, a white pixel at x coordinate seven and y seven. So we can access coordinates on the game board by putting column and row, or x and y, really. So we don't need that, but that's a good test to check that everything's working. So we've now got the game board. I think the next thing to do in this initialization function is to um, create the players. And what I think I'm gonna do is to have um, player one, just call it P1, and I'm gonna create a table to store the data for this player. So I could say the player's x coordinate is 20, the y coordinate is 20. Um, I could have player 2, where the x coordinate is, so if that's 20 from the edge of the screen, I could do 128 minus 20, 127 minus 20, so 107, y is equal to 107. So just start the players off in opposite corners of the screen. 
So I've got two players there with their own X and Y coordinates. And if I wanted to grab the, the X position of player one, I'd do P1 dot X. If I wanted to grab, for example, the Y coordinate of player two, I'd do P2 dot Y. So putting things in a table like this means that we can just use that um, dot notation to grab the values that we need quite quickly and easily. So I've stored the X and Y positions of the two players and what I need to do in the update function is I need to, wherever the players are, I need to um, update the board sort of add, um, what am I doing? I'm sort of adding the current player positions to the board. So I could say um, the board at um, player1.x, player1.y, I'm going to set it to um, whatever player, uh, whatever color I want for player one, and then I could also say board p1, sorry p2.x and p2.y is equal to whatever color I want for player two. So I could put in something like ten um, and eleven or something like that. And because it's adding the players x and y coordinates to the board, we should see two pixels. There we go. So we've got player one towards the top left in yellow and player two towards the bottom right in green. Um, the problem with that, I guess, is just that I don't really want to. I don't really want to have these hard coded in here. So what I could do is I could say. Player one dot color and player two dot color. And then I could go back in here and I could just add a color for each player. So I could say color equals, um, I've forgotten what colors I used, but let's just say something like seven and nine. So there'll be different colors than we used a second ago. But I've then got player one is color seven and player two is color nine. Um, so there we go. So it's now white and orange. Okay, so we've got a board and we've got two players. I think the next thing to do will be to um, move the players around the board. And I think the way I'm going to do that is to have um, a direction. So I'm going to have dx for the x direction, and I'll equal something, and then I'll have dy something for the y. And I think the way that will work is that if, if dx is 0, it means it's not moving in the x, so it's not moving horizontally at all. If I was to set dx to 1, it would mean I'm going to add 1 to the x coordinate every time, so it will move down the screen. And if I was to set it to minus 1, I'm going to subtract 1 from the x coordinate, so it means it's moving up the screen. And the same for y, um, except vertically. Sorry, so I've got that the wrong way around, haven't I? So x would be, 0 is not moving on the x, 1 would actually be adding 1 to x, which is moving to the right, sorry, and minus 1 is moving to the left. And it's the y, where 0 means it wouldn't be moving. 1 would be moving down. And minus 1, you'd subtract 1 from the y coordinate, so it's moving up. So I could say player 1 isn't moving horizontally. It's not moving along the x axis. But set dy to 1, because it is moving down. And then I could say for player 2, dx is equal to 0, so it's not moving horizontally either. But I could say dy is equal to minus 1, so it's moving up the screen. So when we start the game, player 1 is at the top left moving down, 
layer two is at the bottom right moving up. And the way I'm gonna do that, I think is that in the update function, I can say player1.x is equal to player1.x plus player1.dx, so the direction that it's moving in. So at the moment, because dx is zero, it's not gonna add anything to the x, so it'll stay as it is. And I can say player1.y is player1.y plus player one dot direction y. So this is um, updating player one position. And this will be update player two position. And I can just copy and paste this code. And I just need to make sure I swap P1 for P2. So what's actually going to happen is because, so we can ignore the x's because they're not changing. We're going to be adding one to the player's y. So it's going to go 20, 21, 22, 23. So moving down the screen, because this is minus one, oops, because it's minus one, it's going to go 107, 106, 105. So let's try that. There we go. And at a certain point, um, it will go off the edge of the screen, which we'll deal with later. Okay. So now that we've got the direction, it would be quite easy now, I think, to, um, in the update function, to, um, what would we be doing? Kind of like, um, player controls. So that would be player one control. And then later on we'll do player two controls. And the way it works is to say, um, we're just going to say if btn is what we use to get keyboard input in Pico 8. So I'm going to say if btn um, now zero is left, but comma zero means left for the first player. And then if we do, um, so, so this would be the left arrow. Um, this would be the right arrow. This would be up, this would be down. So these are the arrow keys. And then for player two, if we change this zero to a one, I think it's um, E for up, D for down, and then an S and F. So let's test that out. So zero, zero. So if button, um, I should make a note of this really. So that's left. Um, so if the player presses left, we want player one dot dx to be minus one because left means we're moving to the left, so subtracting from the x coordinate each time. And player one dot direction y is zero. I can then say if, uh, so this is right, I can then say if button one zero then we want to do something similar except it's p to the right is p one dot dx is equal one not minus one and p one dot dy is still equal to zero so this is left and right so for left and right the y is always going to be zero but the horizontal is either minus one or one. And we want to do that again for up and down. And so this will be button three. 
and this will be if button four. And so both of these would have P1, the X is going to be zero, but P1 dot Y is equal to one if it's down. And then I'll just copy and paste and minus. So up, we're subtracting one from Y each time, not changing the X. Down, we're adding one to the Y each time and again not changing x. And then player 2 controls. Oops. If I just copy and paste that. So player 2 controls. All I want to do here is I want to change this 0 to a 1 first of all. And then all of these ones want to become twos. This is changing player two's position. So I could test that and I could use the arrow keys for player one. So I have got a problem there. Um, So I've got them the wrong way around. Up is one, down. Is that right? Down is one, and up is minus one. Now that is right. Let me just try that again. So if I press left, right, so left and right work, I've got a problem with uh -huh. zero, one, two, three. There we go. So this will be zero, one, two, three. I have no idea why I did that, but there we go. So the buttons are. Left, right, up, down is zero, one, two, three. So let's try that again. So I've got left, sorry, right, up, left, down. So you can see I can move the white player one around with the arrow keys. So I'm just using the left, right, up and down arrow keys. And if I try again, but this time I'm using um, F, E, whoops, if I go off the board, I get an error at the moment, but that's fine. So I've got F, E, S, and D. There we go. So I can move players 1 and 2 around. Something you'll notice um, is that a lot of this code, so you can see I'm creating player 1 and player 2, and then all the code I've got, so all this input for player 1, and then I'm just duplicating almost exactly the same code but for player two. Same here. I've got code for player one and player two. It's identical code, just it's P1 and P2. Same here, I'm updating the position for both players. Um, and so I've got a lot of repeating code. So what I might do is I might say um, players is equal to and I might add P1 and P2 to a list of players. Because then what I can do is I can loop through each player in my players list and do the same thing for both of them in a loop. So there'll be lots of times where I'll halve the amount of code I need. So instead of saying, do this for player one, do this for player two, I can say, do this for each of the players in, the, in this table. And then later on, if I had players three and four, which I know um, you can have up to four inputs with game controllers in Pico 8. In theory, we shouldn't need any additional code to cope with three or four players. And the way that we do that is to say, um, if 
for p in all players do n. So we could then, I'll remove all of this code eventually. We could say um, player controls and then we could say left would be, oops, in fact what I'll do is I'll do left, right, up and down. Cut that. I'll remove all of this. So I'm replacing all of the code to control with this. So we've got left, right, up, and down. So I've halved the amount of code here because I've just got left, right, up, and down, and I'll just do that for each player in this player's table which is here. So instead of P1, because I'm looping through each player in turn and calling it P, I can just say P here. And that will be player one and then it will be player two. The only problem is this zero. So it's comma zero for player one but it's actually comma one for player two. So I'm gonna need some way of referencing what number player it is. So if I say player number, so player one, let's say number is one. Player two, let's say number is two. So then what I could do is I could just take so player one is one and player two is two, but for the input, I actually need zero and one. So it's just one less than the player number. So I can just say P dot N. So for player one, that will give me one minus one. And here I can say P dot N minus one. It's the same code. So. So this will go through each player in the players list. So first of all, it'll be P is player one. So it'll change all the player one stuff. But player one dot N is equal to one. So minus one, that's zero. So that should work. Yeah, so I can move player one and I can move player two. There we go. And it means I can do the same. So, so adding the current player's position. I can do that here. And I can say board for that player equals the player's color. And I can get rid of this. So again, because I'm doing this for both players, because it's within this for loop here, And then I can do the same. So updating position, if I cut that out and put it in here and say update player position and just get rid of uh, reference to whether it's player one or player two. And then I can get rid of this. There we go. So I've now just got my list of players and I can write all of my code to act on each player in the list in turn. So it still works. There we go. So um, we've got two players and the players move around the board. I think I just need to add some code to so there's no idea of a player winning or losing at the moment. 
So in my update function, I think I want to say, let's have a look. So this is um, check lose. So I want to check if a player is losing or not. Um, and I can say if player, remember I can just do, instead of P1 and then P2, I can just do P. Um, so what I could say is if board p.x, p.y, if it's not equal to the background color, I think it was bg, yeah, bg, oh, bg color is two. So I want to say if If the board at the player's position isn't the background, then the player's hit something. And then what I could do is delete that player from the list of players. So I could say delete from this player's list, which is this list here, that player. So if any player has touched something on the board that's not the background, so either the other player or themselves, they're deleted from the list of players. So let's test that out. Try that again. There we go. So what's happening is I've got to try and play with two players at once. But once that player hits this, you can see that player stops. That player's not playing anymore. So they've, they're have they out of the game. And player two's going, and now player two's out. But actually, once the list, once there's only one player remaining, the game's over. So I should probably say... Um, if the length of, I think length is this hash. So if the length of players is, is, is one, then return. So don't do anything. So it will return out of this update function. So it won't do any of this stuff. So it won't keep playing the game. It won't take any input. It won't update the board. It won't do anything if there's only one player left. So let's try that again. So this player is going to hit this player. Yeah, and the game stops. So neither player is playing anymore. But because there's only one player in the list of players, so if player one hits player two, player one is going to be deleted from this list. So the list will just be player two. So what I could do is I could say um, in this draw function, I could say if... Um, so show winner and I could say if the length of um, the players lists is equal to one then um, let's just start by printing the word winner and let's print it in the middle of the screen so something like that and let's do it in color one. So once there's only one player left, that player's one. So I'm just going to print the word winner to begin with. Um, let's have a go. So there we go. So it just says winner. But what I want to do is to show who has won. Um, so if there's only one player in the list, then players one is the first item in that player's list, but of course there's only one player in that list. So that will be the player left in that list that's the winner because it's the first item in the player's list. 
So I could say, um, P, and I'm going to use two dots to join. So it's going to print the letter P, and then the players, the first player in the list, which is the winner, their number. So that'll be player one or player two. So it'll either write P1 or P2. And then I want to join that to writing um, wins. And I need a space. So P2 wins because player one has hit player two. In fact, I could try. This should say player one. Yeah, player one wins. So we can now see who's won. Um, so this is the text to display. This is the X and Y coordinate, and this is the color. So what I could do is I could say players one dot color. So I could actually display the winner message in the winner's color. So player two wins is now in um, orange. And if it was the other way around, player one wins is in white. Um, the problem that we might have, it's going to be hard for me to show this probably, because I can't play two players at once. Um, is that I think I'm going to have problems. There we go. So you see that the W in the word wins is covered by the snake. And if the game has been playing a while, you might not be able to read that message because um, it will be the same color as the snake or the bike, or whatever it is. So what I might also do before I print is to create a rectangle. And if I type rect fill, it will fill that rectangle in. Um, and I want to put the X and Y position, so I want to start at the top left. Sorry, I want to start on the left-hand side, which is zero, and just above the text, so So that's the start position, so zero across, so the, the very left hand side, and 55 down, and then 128, which is right on the other side, and then seven, something like 70, and color zero, which is black. So what should happen now? We've got the rectangle, the player one isn't in quite the right place. Um, so let's move that down a bit to 60. Whoops. Okay, I'll explain that in a second. We can we can fix that. I'll just get this bit working first. <laughs> let's just um, hang on a minute. I've got to try and get. This is the trouble with playing two players at the same time. There we go. So I might just make that um, sorry, I'm just being a perfectionist. I just want it to be whoops. There we go. So the P one wins is now in the center of that rectangle. So the error that you saw just then, I think, is because it's trying to. So it's gone off to past the left hand side of the board. And so it's looking at board column zero. And then as it moves past the left, it's looking for board column minus one. And it doesn't exist, which is why it's saying there's a nil value. So what we probably need to do is to say, um, 
So check if the player loses. It's not just if the board at that position has another color in it. So it's not just if the players hit the opponent or itself. It's also if the player has hit um, the edges of the board. So I could say if p dot x is less than zero or p dot x is greater than 127 or p dot y is less than zero or p dot y is greater than 127 or and then this bit that we've got here I could probably um, make that look a bit nicer um, let's just do that so if the player's x position is less than zero so it's gone off the left hand side or greater than 127 so gone off the right hand side or the y is less than zero so it's gone above the top or y is below 127 which is off the bottom or there's something in the way of where the player is then we delete the player and the player's out of the game so we're now checking um, so it's check lose collision or outside of board and then hopefully we shouldn't have that problem anymore So I wonder if I need to delete from that. Is there a way of breaking out of that loop? It's either break or the word continue. No. So what I really don't want to do is if, if the player has hit the end, I don't really want to do any of this stuff. There we go. I think what was happening was that the player was being deleted and then it was trying to do some other stuff. I don't know. And it was probably trying to update the player's position still. But just by breaking out, it just means for each player, let's do this. If the player is out of the game, we don't need to do anything more with that player and it will then go back to looping through to the second player. At least I think that's what's happening. So there we go. And <laughs> I don't know if this is going to work, but um, I did say in theory the code that we've written means that we can just add a third player. So let's say we had a third player that was uh, number three. And let's say this player is 67, so in the middle of the screen. Um, color 11, 
and maybe it's um, also moving down the screen. Um, oh, and we need to add player three to the list. So player one's, oops, player one's out. Oh, it does work. Let me just um, try and control both of these together. So we've got player one, player two, and player two wins. I'll see if I can get player three to win to see if it works. Um, there we go. So I think by using this um, for each player in the players list possibly made things slightly more complicated, but it, it meant less code for one. And it did also mean that we could now in theory have a four player game um, just as easily. So I think I'm going to save tron.p8. Um, I'll probably put the code on GitHub or something um, in case you want to see the finished finished code. But I think that's it. Thank you.